Chapter 21 is over medications that we use for diabetes. So first we'll talk about um, what the pancreas does and diabetes and, and, and everything just to get an idea before we talk about the meds because it'll make more sense when we talk about the meds. So we have adenosine triphosphate or ATP. This is cellular energy. It drives all the cellular reactions of the body. ATP is like the gas that makes the body's engine run. Um, inside the cells, glucose is used to make ATP. So glucose is the most common simple carbohydrate and the main source of fuel for the human body. For normal body function, people need a constant supply of glucose in the blood that's ready to enter the cells to make ATP. But if there's too much glucose, it causes problems. The pancreas is an endocrine gland that makes insulin and glucagon. The beta cells make insulin and the alpha cells make glucagon. The right balance of insulin and glucagon along with food intake ensures that we have the right amount of glucose in the blood. So insulin. Insulin is the hormone, remember, it's produced by those beta cells of the pancreas to prevent blood glucose levels from becoming too high. A blood glucose level above normal is called hyperglycemia. It's made and released from the beta cells into the blood whenever blood glucose levels start to rise above normal. So hyperglycemia is the trigger for the secretion of insulin. And the action is to restore normal blood glucose levels by binding to the receptors of different cells and moving glucose into them. So think of insulin as like a key to the door of the cell. So we're, you know, we have all these doors on the cells that allow sugar to enter the cells. The insulin is the key that will open those doors so that the sugar can or glucose can go into the cells to be made into or used for cellular energy. This results in a therapeutic blood glucose level and glucose in the cells for ATP. And it's called the hormone of plenty because in a normal healthy person, when they eat well, their blood levels of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats go up. And when there's more than enough glucose for ATP, insulin facilitates the extra glucose to be converted to glycogen, which is the storage form of that extra glucose. Low blood levels of glucose is termed hypoglycemia. This is not enough glucose to make enough ATP. This slows the body's metabolism and it can even lead to death. When we have hypoglycemia, glucagon is released by the alpha cells of the pancreas and its action is to break down that glycogen or stored glucose that we just talked about. It breaks it down into glucose and the glucose is then released into the blood to bring the levels back to normal. So insulin and glucagon are both natural hormones released by the pancreas, but they're also drugs that we use to treat hyper and hypoglycemia. Even though the cell types for insulin and glucagon secretion are both in the pancreas, problems most often occur with the cells that secrete insulin. So diabetes is a metabolic disease that results from either the loss of the ability to make insulin so if the body's not making insulin, we just have all of this glucose floating around in the bloodstream, not going into the cells to be used for energy. Or the loss of the receptor sensitivity to the presence of insulin. So think about that lock and key analogy that I was talking about. If we make insulin and that's fine, that's great. But then somebody went through and changed the key or changed the locks on all of the doors then we're not getting, even though we have insulin, we're not getting sugar into the cells to be used for energy. The first result of either of these problems is an increase in blood glucose levels because the glucose is just floating around in the bloodstream, not going into the cells to be used for energy. The two most common types of diabetes are type one and type two. They have a lot of the same symptoms and the long-term complications are the same, but the drugs that we use to treat them are different. In type 1 diabetes, people do not make insulin, okay? And in type 2 diabetes, people continue to make some insulin. So remember, insulin facilitates the movement of glucose from the blood into the cells to make ATP. When the beta cells don't make or secrete insulin anymore, the glucose can't enter the cells and the blood glucose levels become dangerously high. So the body switches from using glucose to using fat to make ATP. And overall, the body has less ATP available. And we think, yay, I'm losing fat, right? But there's still an issue with hyperglycemia here. 
Signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia include the three P's, which is polyuria, polyphagia, and polydipsia. Polyuria is urinating a lot, polyphagia is excessive hunger and eating, and polydipsia is excessive thirst, as well as weight loss and fatigue. If it's left untreated, the body uses more fat for fuel and a byproduct, ketoacids, forms faster than it can be excreted. And we have DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis. This can result in coma and even death. People with type 1 diabetes have to take insulin every day. Everybody's different in their needs and we'll get to talking about the different types of insulin that meet these needs. Type 1 diabetes can happen at any age, but it most commonly begins in kids and young adults. It actually used to be termed juvenile diabetes because of this. Then we have type 2 diabetes. Type 2 is much more common than type 1. It's thought to be genetic, even though not everyone with the known gene mutations ends up develop, developing it. It's also linked to lifestyle, with risk factors being obesity and a sedentary lifestyle. In type 2, the beta cells still make some insulin, but the insulin receptors are not sensitive to it. So it doesn't bind well to the receptors unless glucose is able to move from the blood into the cells. The result here is also hyperglycemia. Type 2 has a slower onset with more gradual symptoms because there's still insulin being made and used in the body. And because some insulin is being used in the body, fat isn't used for fuel, so we usually don't see DKA. Without adequate amounts of insulin, people with either, with either type of diabetes will have major changes in the blood vessels that lead to organ damage, serious health problems, and early death. There is a table for the, that lists the complications of poorly controlled diabetes um, on page 390 in the book. So for our anti-diabetic medications, they used to be called hypoglycemic agents, but we really don't call them hypoglycemic agents anymore because we don't want anyone to be hypoglycemic. They're just anti-diabetic. Usually people are gonna use two or more for best control. And they're classified by their actions or their structures. There's eight major classes. The mechanism of action in each of these classes is a little bit different. And the dosage amounts are based on the patient. Um, Non-insulin anti-diabetic drugs are oral and injectable drugs that um, use lots of different actions to help lower the blood glucose levels. Some patients with type 2 diabetes might also require insulin as a temporary therapy or when the disease progresses. So those eight major classes of anti-diabetic drugs are insulin stimulators, biguanides, insulin sensitizers, alpha glucosidase inhibitors, incretin mimetics, the amylin analogs, and the DPP-4 inhibitors, and the sodium glucose co-transport inhibitors. The intended response of all of these meds is to keep blood glucose in the normal range and keep glucose out of the urine. Side effects of all of these are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and a rash. And adverse effects are severe hypoglycemia in some, but not all of these meds. Metformin can cause lactic acidosis. The incretin mimetics and sodium glucose co-transport inhibitors create an increased risk for pancreatitis. Also note that sulfonylureas might cause increased sun sensitivity or that photosensitivity, as well as blurred vision, fluid retention, and anemia. Meglitonides also might cause dizziness, back pain, upper respiratory infections, and flu-like aches. Metformin and the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors can also cause bloating, flatulence, indigestion, abdominal pain, and headache. Thiazolidinone drugs also might cause upper respiratory infections, headaches, muscle aches, fluid retention, weight gain, and anemia. So before we give um, any of these anti-diabetic medications, I want to make sure that I'm giving extensive teaching to my patient. Okay, that's the, the number one most important thing is education. Um, their dosing schedules can be really complex and it's important to coordinate the schedule with their meals because we are taking the place of what the pancreas normally does when we're eating. <clears throat> Note that metformin requires lots of different actions um, before giving the drug. Check to see if the patient is scheduled for any surgery or procedure that involves dye um, and let the, uh, make sure they let the provider know if there is something scheduled. 
with alpha-glucosidase inhibitors and thiazolidinone drugs. Check the patient's most recent lab tests, especially liver levels, liver enzyme levels. These drugs are contraindicated for patients with liver disease. Teach your patients the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. That's very important. Um, they should also take their meds exactly as prescribed and avoid drinking alcohol. They should keep some sort of glucose with them at all times. Um, they should always carry some sort of carbohydrate um, glucose that contains at least 50, 15 grams of carbs in, a, um, in their pocket or their purse or their car or whatever to eat at that first sign of hypoglycemia. Um, and back to the alcohol, if they do drink alcohol, it should be limited to one um, serving and it should be taken with food or right after the person eats their meal. Um, we also want to teach them to check their blood glucose before they exercise um, and they should weigh themselves at the same time every day. Um, they should monitor their heart rate. Um, we don't want them to take their meds if they're not able to eat. They should contact their provider because again, these medications work as the pancreas would work um, when they're eating. So if they're not eating, then that could be a, a problem. They should also know the signs and symptoms of liver impairment um, and, and know the signs of water retention. Um, in our kids, some of these are approved for kids under 10, but a lot are not. Um, the dose is based on response here, not weight. And that's the same for every patient. Um, metformin and megalidinides are, are used in kids over 10, but most of the others are not. Um, Non-insulin anti-diabetic drugs from the sulfonylurea, alpha-glucosidase inhibitor, thiazolidinone, um, incretin mimetics, amylin analog, DPP-4 inhibitor, and sodium glucose co-transport inhibitor class are not recommended for kids kids that have type 2 diabetes. Again, we base all dosing on the response from the patient rather than the weight. Um, with pregnancy and lactation, we take them off of all of their anti-diabetic medications and revert to just insulin until they're no longer pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, insulin treats hyperglycemia well during pregnancy. The rest are too risky for pregnancy and lactation. In older adults, there's an increased risk of hypoglycemia, especially if they're on other drugs like beta blockers or warfarin, and it might be harder to recognize hypoglycemia. Metformin has to be used with caution in adults over 65. The older adults more likely to have heart failure, poor circulation, uh, kidney disease, or liver disease. And all of these problems greatly increase the risk for complication of lactic acidosis. So let's first talk about those insulin stimulators. These work directly on the beta cells of the pancreas to help them release insulin. Um, side effects might include sun sensitivity, blurred vision, fluid retention, anemia, dizziness, back pain, upper respiratory infections, and flu-like achiness. You can see these on page 392 in the green box. Um, we want to teach our patients to tell providers if they have any allergy to sulfonamide antibiotics. We want to teach them about photosensitivity precautions and to take these with every meal, even if they um, eat more than three meals a day with the megalidinides. Then we have our, bar our biguanides, specifically metformin. This inhibits the conversion of glycogen into glucose and its release into the blood. So it slows that intestinal absorption of glucose as well and increases the sensitivity of insulin receptors. Some side effects are bloating, flatulence, indigestion, abdominal pain, and headache. Um, a lot of people also complain of diarrhea when they start metformin, but that gets better with continued use. Adverse effects are lactic acidosis and kidney failure, especially if it's mixed with radiopaque dye, which is why we want to make sure they're letting any provider that's ordering testing with dye know that they're on metformin so that can be planned accordingly. Teach your patients that are on metformin not to crush or chew it. Take it with food. Um, again, that GI discomfort, that nausea and diarrhea goes away in time. Um, tell them to drink plenty of water and check with the prescriber before any diagnostic procedure involving dye is used or is done. Um, in pregnancy and lactation, again, not recommended. So we're going to revert to just insulin during that pregnancy and lactation period. Then we have our insulin sensitizers. These don't work on the beta cells. They actually increase the sensitivity of the insulin receptor binding on the naturally secreted insulin. So it improves the movement of glucose from the blood into the cells. 
Sensitizers also decrease liver glucose production um, and some help reduce the absorption of glucose from the intestinal tract into the blood. The result of this is um, of this action is that blood glucose does not rise as far or as fast after a meal. Um, side effects are upper respiratory infections, headaches, muscle aches, fluid retention, weight gain, and anemia. Adverse effects are heart failure, liver impairment, increased cholesterol levels. Teach your patients to check for yellowing of the skin, roof of the mouth, and whites of the eyes. That's for that liver impairment. Um, check for sudden weight gain, which might be a sign of worsening heart failure, and report any vision changes, as well as keeping any appointments for lab work. Then we have our alpha glucosidase inhibitors. These slow the digestion of dietary starches and other complex carbs by inhibiting the enzyme that breaks them down into glucose. So the blood glucose doesn't rise as high or as fast after eating. These don't cause hypoglycemia unless they're combined with other therapy for diabetes. Side effects are related to GI issues here like we've talked about for other anti-diabetic drugs. And adverse effects um, is that they should not be used for people who have difficulty digesting or absorbing food and they can cause liver impairment. Want to teach your patients to always take these with a meal, keep the individual tablets in wrapped packages, monitor and report any yellowing of the skin, pain in the liver area or darkening of the urine. GI problems are very common with these and to take other prescribed drugs two hours before or two hours after because again these affect absorption. In Creighton memetics or GLP-1 agonists act like the normal gut hormones that are secreted with meals. They inhibit glucagon secretion, so the liver production of glucose is reduced and they delay gastric emptying. So that slows the rate of glucose absorption in the blood and it makes the person feel full. These act like the normal gut hormones, okay? Some side effects are increased risk of pancreatitis, increased risk for certain types of thyroid cancer as well. So teach your patients to always take these as directed. Um, the dosage and frequency might vary. If it comes in an injector pen, those need to be stored in the refrigerator. They should always follow the package instructions and monitor injection sites for signs of infection. Monitor for swelling in the neck, persistent pain above or around the stomach as well, and notify the prescriber of symptoms of pancreatitis. You can see all these GLP-1 agonists on page 396. And DPP-4 inhibitors inhibit the enzyme that normally breaks down and inactivates the incretin hormones, especially GLP-1. So this slows the inactivation of the natural incretin hormones and increases the active incretin hormone levels in the body. All of that means that before and after the meal, blood glucose levels will be reduced. And also note that these only work when the glucose is elevated. Um, side effects are abdominal pain, pancreatitis, increased incidence of respiratory infections, higher incidence of allergic reactions, and severe joint pain. Uh, teach your patients to monitor for allergic reactions. Um, report any signs and symptoms of pancreatitis, like persistent pain above and around the stomach, especially with nausea and vomiting, as well as reporting severe joint pain. You can see these DPP-4 inhibitors on page 397 in the green box. And then our amylin analogs. These delay the gastric emptying and lower after meal blood glucose levels. They trigger that feeling of fullness and satisfaction in the brain and they suppress glucagon action too, which prevents the liver from releasing glucose. Side effects are reduced or delayed delivery of other medications, significant nausea, but that will decrease over time, pancreatitis and fatty changes in the subcutaneous tissue. Teach your patients that we don't mix these with insulin. Um, we only use the abdomen or the thighs as injection sites. If these are in pen form, they need to be stored in the refrigerator and they should follow their package instructions, um, monitor their infection sites, monitor their blood glucose levels as well, and monitor for allergic reactions and report any signs and symptoms of pancreatitis. We want to also teach them to take other drugs at least an hour before or an hour after injecting these um, and eating a meal. And then our sodium glucose co-transport inhibitors. These, um, these lower blood glucose levels by preventing kidney reabsorption of glucose that was filtered from the blood into the urine, and the filtered glucose is excreted in the urine instead of going back to the blood. Side effects are pancreatitis, 
um, increased urine output, hypotension, dizziness, risk for falls, urinary tract infections, and skin infections in the perineum. You can see a list of these meds on page 398 in the green box. Teach your patients to get up slowly to lower the risk of falls. Um, drink plenty of water. Report any pain or burning during urination. Um, report any soreness or swelling, reddening, or irritation of the area around the genitals. And report any symptoms of pancreatitis. Then we have oral combination anti-diabetic drugs. Um, type 2 diabetes is best controlled using more than one anti-diabetic drug. Some drugs are combined to simplify that therapy rather than taking multiple medications. They're just taking one tablet that has multiple medications or one injection that has multiple uh, medications. So the one thing that I want you to know about our combination meds, you can see these on page 400, but don't necessarily worry about the names and stuff like that. Anything that um, I want you to know about combination meds is that the patient needs to be aware of the side and adverse effects of each med that are in that combination. Okay, so anything that I would teach the patient about, um, for example, um, pioglitazone and glimepiride in the Dutact, I would teach them about, again, both that pioglitazone and glimepiride. Okay, um, so I hope that makes sense. Anything that you need to know about a combination med is just that um, the effects will, you'll have the effects of each med that's in that combination. Um, drug therapy with diabetes prolongs life and reduces the risk for complications. People that are able to control their blood glucose levels with drugs, diet, and exercise live longer, healthier lives. The first drug um, that we talk about with type 1, or the only drug we talk about with type 1 diabetes is insulin. The goal of insulin therapy for type 1 diabetes is to maintain blood glucose levels within the normal range, avoid DKA, and prevent or delay the blood vessel changes that lead to organ damage. Insulin is a small protein. It's destroyed by the stomach acids and intestinal enzymes, and it has to be taken parenterally, so that's an injection. We get some insulin from animal sources. You might see some labeled porcine or bovine, um, but most of it now is synthetic or made in a lab. Regardless of the insulin type, it's a high alert drug, meaning that it can cause serious harm if, wrong, if the wrong dose is given. If a dose is given to a patient that it's not prescribed for, or if a dose is not given to a patient that it is prescribed for, it can cause lots of problems. For most people, we inject it subcutaneously using a specific insulin syringe, specific, um, special internal or, and external insulin pumps also can be used to deliver insulin either continuously or as needed or hourly or whatever. Whatever. So the intended responses um, and side and adverse effects, um, the intended response again with everything else is that blood glucose levels with the, are remain in that normal range. Um, no glucose or acetone is in the urine. The blood lipid levels are in the normal range. Um, side effects are related to having repeated injections at one site. Um, these problems include injection site infections and changes in the skin and subcutaneous tissue at those injection sites. Um, adverse effects are hypoglycemia or insulin shock. Um, this is dangerous because brain cells are very sensitive to low blood glucose levels and the patient can become non-responsive very quickly. So patients must learn to balance their carbohydrate intake with the timing of peak action for whatever insulin type they take um, to help prevent hypoglycemia. There is a huge box on page 401 that lists the different types and durations of, um, of different insulins. This just shows the different, or an insulin syringe. It's measured in units. Um, I mentioned that there's different types of insulin. Rapid acting insulin does just what it sounds like. It acts very quickly. Um, the onset of these is 15 to 18 minutes. The peak is 30 minutes to three hours, and the duration is three to five hours. Then we have short acting with an onset of 30 minutes, a peak of two to five hours, and a duration of five to eight hours. Intermediate acting, which includes NPH and mixes intermediate acting with short acting insulin. Um, NPH has an onset of an hour and a half, a peak of four to 12 hours, and a duration of 10 or more hours. When we mix the intermediate acting with short acting, we get a faster onset, like 15 to 30 minutes, as well as a longer duration, like 10 to 24 hours. So that's beneficial for your patient. These mixes aren't used very often, though, because there's a lot of room for error when we mix them. 
and it can be difficult to teach patients to give them, them to themselves. And then we have long acting, which is an onset of one to two hours, no peak, and a constant level in your system for up to 12 or 24 hours. When we do insulin therapy, it takes time to work with the patient to see how their body will respond while making adjustments to determine what the best regimen is for them. So we spent some time going um, through how the hormone insulin works in the body. Injected insulin works the same way. It binds to the insulin receptors on the cells, um, facilitating the movement of glucose from the blood into the cells to be used for ATP. The intended response is that blood glucose levels remain in the normal range. There's no glucose or acetone in the urine and blood lipid levels remain within the normal range as well, which would mean that we're not using fat for energy. Most of the side effects are related to tissue problems from using the same injection site. Like I mentioned, it's important to rotate that injection site to prevent this. The main adverse effect is hypoglycemia, sometimes called insulin shock. I already said this, but I'll say it again. Hypoglycemia is very dangerous because brain cells are sensitive to low blood glucose and the patient can become non-responsive very quickly. The risk of death is high. Signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia are anxiety, confusion, loss of consciousness, cool, clammy skin, headache, hunger, sweating, rapid pounding heart rate, shaking, and tremors. A couple of slides ago, I mentioned that it's important to find the right insulin regimen for each patient. This is a schedule of how to take insulin in order to prevent hyperglycemia. The most effective regimens are those that provide insulin in a pattern that closely resembles the way insulin is normally released from the healthy pancreas. It's important to keep the blood glucose levels balanced throughout the day. In a normal healthy pancreas, more insulin is secreted when we eat and we have a spike in blood glucose. Usually the patient injects long acting insulin at the beginning of the day for a basal dose. Shorter acting insulin is taken before meals and snacks. The amount of short acting insulin needed and injected is based on blood glucose levels. And we call this a sliding scale. When we have a patient on a sliding scale, they check their blood glucose level before meals and they take insulin based on what the level is. So you'll have ranges and wherever the glucose falls on that range tells you how much insulin to take. It's important, or the important thing here is to make sure that they eat within 15 minutes so the insulin we just gave doesn't make them hypoglycemic. The long or intermediate, intermediate acting insulin um, in the morning and then small doses of short acting before meals is called the intensified regimen. Um, this is most effective in keeping blood glucose levels within the normal range throughout the day. When we're determining the right dosing for the patient, we need to check their sugars a lot. When they wake up before meals, within a couple hours after meals, at bedtime, and a couple times in the middle of the night. This will show us the pattern that their body follows so that we can dose accordingly. Once they're pretty consistent on their schedule, they'll usually have their glucose checked before meals and at bedtime, and that's usually sufficient. So we'll give them the insulin and we'll be teaching patients how to give it to themselves at home. It's important to give only the prescribed dose, check their glucose prior, and check the order carefully. Use the correct insulin. It sounds like <clears throat> it's, you know, that's a, a silly mistake to make, but it's easy to mix them up when we have Humulin R and Humulin N, etc. They all sound alike. Check the vial for color and clarity. Insulin should be clear and colorless or cloudy depending on the type, but there should never be particles in it. Um, we roll the vial to mix and warm it. Um, they're stored in the refrigerator. We don't ever shake them because we don't want bubbles. Then we select the appropriate, or sorry, when we select the appropriate site, remember to rotate sites. There's a picture um, in your book of the site rotation. Um, and I lost the page that that's on. Let's see here. Well, I can't find the page that it's on, but make sure that they're rotating sites um, for your for insulin injections. Um, we do that ourselves when we're administering it and then teach them to do that at home. Um, let's see, we clean the site with an alcohol swab, grasp the fold of skin, insert the needle at 90 degrees. If the patient is really tiny, you can insert it at a 45 degree ang angle and inject. After the injection is complete, we withdraw the needle. We don't massage the site because it can change the rate that the insulin is absorbed. If you're using two types of insulin, you may be able to mix them, but you don't. Um, you would need to check with the pharmacist because some of them can't be mixed. You can look um, for further instructions in the book on how to mix insulin, but you'll learn this in your medical assisting class as well. 
So again, we're going to teach our patients those same things. Don't massage the injection site. Check for signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Be sure their meals and snacks are eaten. Assess the response and check blood glucose when instructed and document it. The whole process of drawing up and injecting the correct amount of insulin without contaminating the drug or the needle can be scary to a patient who's newly diagnosed. So we have to provide a lot of support and education for them. Teach your patients how to self-administer that insulin. Teach them how to properly store the insulin. Check those injection sites. Rotate the injection sites. Don't skip or delay any meals. Know the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Always have a spare bottle of each insulin type and always carry a carbohydrate source um, and keep to the schedule of insulin and meals. Lots of kids have type 1 diabetes and require insulin injections and blood testing of glucose levels. Um, kids are active and their need for insulin fluctuates, so it can be hard to get good control over their glucose levels. More frequent monitoring is necessary and a more flexible insulin dosing schedule is necessary as well. Um, the disease is often more difficult to control during the physically stressful time of pregnancy. In addition, some patients who do not have diabetes might have problems with hyperglycemia only during pregnancy. This is called gestation diabetes. Um, if it's untreated, there can be complications for mom and baby. We use insulin during pregnancy and the needs change throughout the pregnancy. So like kids, more frequent monitoring and flexible dosing schedules might be necessary. Usually after pregnancy, things go back to normal. So if mom wasn't diabetic before, she can most often come off the insulin. And if she was diabetic before, she can most often go back to the schedule she used before pregnancy. Older patients can benefit from the use of pre-filled insulin syringes, cartridges, or pens for easier dosing. That way they just have to dial the correct amount of, um, or the syringe already has the correct amount. They don't have to draw anything up. They're at higher risk for hypoglycemia, especially if they take other drugs that increase the hypoglycemic response. And lots of older adults don't eat as much as younger people, so we have to make sure that they're getting the right dosing regimen for them. And that's it on diabetes.